This is IB Physics SL. I am Mr. King. Topic 7 Atomic, Nuclear, and Particle Physics. Section 7.3 The Structure of Matter. Part 2 Feynman Diagrams. Feynman Diagrams are named after Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman was an American physicist. He worked on the Manhattan Project developing the atomic bomb just after obtaining his Ph.D. He shared the 1965 Nobel Prize in Physics for his, quote, fundamental work in quantum electrodynamics. And this is the work from which we get the Feynman diagrams. He was also a great popularizer of physics in his day, basically like the Neil deGrasse Tyson of his time. And according to Physics World Journal, he's one of the 10 greatest physicists of all time. Let's hear what my man Bill Gates has to say about Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman was an incredible scientist. He spent most of his time at Caltech. The idea of quantum physics, where all these particles are interacting in mysterious ways, he came up with a thing called Feynman diagrams that he won the Nobel Prize for. Perhaps even more importantly, he was an amazing teacher. He did a series of lectures which were for people who didn't specialize in physics. It's such a great example of how he could explain things in a fun and interesting way to anyone. And he was very funny. Incidentally, at the time of uh, Kepler, the problem of what drove the planets around the sun was answered in some, in some, by some people by saying that there were angels behind here beating their wings and pushing the planet along around orbit. As we'll see that that answer is not very far from the truth, the only difference is that the angels sit in a different direction and the wings go down. Dr. Feynman used a tough process on himself where if he didn't really understand something, he would push himself. Do I understand this boundary case? Do I understand why we don't do it this other way? Do I really understand this? And because he had pushed himself to have such a deep understanding, his ability to take you through the path of the different possibilities was incredible. Uh, oxygen, for instance, in the air would like to be next to carbon. And if they get near each other, they snap together. If you can get it faster, by heating it up somehow, some way, they come close enough to the carbon and snap in. And that gives a lot of jiggly motion, which might hit some other atoms, making those go faster so they can climb up and bump against other carbon atoms. And they jiggle, and they make mothers jiggle, and you get a terrible catastrophe. That catastrophe is a fire. He's taking something that is a little mysterious to most people and using very simple concepts to explain how it works. He doesn't even tell you he's talking about fire till the very end, and you feel like you're kind of figuring it out together with him. Feynman made science so fascinating. He reminded us how much fun it is, and everybody can have a pretty full understanding. So he's such a joyful example of you know, how we'd all like to, to learn and think about things. Thanks, Bill. Let's take a look at a Feynman diagram. First of all, what a Feynman diagram actually is is kind of convoluted. It's described as a pictorial representation of the mathematical expressions describing the behavior and interaction of subatomic particles. That's a mouthful. This is to say that the diagrams don't show the actual path of the particles, uh, it's a representation of the nature of the interaction. So there's a lot of information that isn't included in a Feynman diagram, but they're really, really helpful for understanding the essence of what's going on. There are some rules for either drawing your own Feynman diagrams or interpreting a Feynman diagram. So first of all, particles are always represented by straight lines and exchange particles are wavy lines. So in this example, you can see four straight lines with arrowheads representing electrons, and then a wavy line in the middle representing a photon, which is the exchange particle of the electromagnetic force. At each vertex, there will be two particles and an exchange particle. 
time typically progresses from left to right in a Feynman diagram. This part's a little weird. Particles have arrows that point forward in time, and antiparticles have arrows that point backward in time. No particles are actually traveling back in time. Having an arrow that points backwards is just an easy way to represent the opposite of a particle, antiparticles. And finally, there's always one arrow into and one arrow out of a vertex. Let's take a look at some examples of Feynman diagrams, and we can practice interpreting them, and we can see all the different types of interactions that can be represented in this form. We'll start with the Feynman diagram from the previous page. So we see all the arrows are pointing forward in time, that is from left to right, which means they are particles, not antiparticles. Next, we can see on the space axis that the particles are approaching each other. At some point, they exchange a photon. This is actually what we call a virtual photon. This is a photon that exists for an incredibly minuscule amount of time that is really just a manifestation of the electromagnetic field through which these two electrons are interacting. This means that the photon is considered the exchange particle of the electromagnetic force. It's the particle that is transmitted between other particles that are interacting via the electromagnetic force. With all this information interpreted from the Feynman diagram, we can come to the conclusion that this is showing the electromagnetic repulsion of two negatively charged electrons. In the next examples, we're going to look at just one vertex and see how rotating it and looking at mirror images can change what it represents. This should look familiar so far. As we saw before, the arrows point forward, which means these are particles and not antiparticles. We can see that a photon leaves an interaction. And for this part alone, we can interpret this as an electron emitting a photon. If we rotate that 90 degrees, we get a completely different interaction. Here, we can see that the top arrow is pointing backward in time, which means it must represent an antiparticle. The bottom arrow is pointing forward in time, so it must be representing a particle. We can also see that there's a photon, which is a quantum of energy, that enters the interaction. And then we see a positron, the antiparticle, and an electron, the particle, leaving the interaction. Remember, the backwards arrow just means it's an antiparticle. We can interpret this interaction as representing pair production. That's when, from some energy, in this case, the form of a photon or represented by a photon, a particle and antiparticle pair are spontaneously produced. Now let's look at a mirror image of that previous Feynman diagram. Here we have a top arrow going forward in time, a particle. The bottom arrow going backward in time, an antiparticle. We can interpret this as a positron and an electron entering the interaction. And we can see that there's a photon, again, representing some energy, leaving the interaction. This is the opposite of pair production. This is a particle-antiparticle annihilation. The particle, the electron, and its antiparticle, the positron, collide with each other, annihilate each other. They cease to exist. And from this interaction, energy is released in the form of a photon. Let's take a look at one more. This is the mirror image of the original Feynman diagram. Here, both arrows point backward. This represents an antiparticle the whole time. We can see that there's a photon that enters the interaction. We can interpret this as a positron, which is an antiparticle, absorbing a photon. There are so many other electromagnetic interactions that can be represented by Feynman diagrams, and of course we will look at more examples of these. Now let's talk about strong interactions and how they can be represented by Feynman diagrams. Particles interact via the electromagnetic force because of their electrical charge. Well, in addition to electrical charge, quarks have a property called color charge, and this is involved in their interaction via the strong force. Hadrons are considered colorless. 
Baryons, which are three quarks or three antiquarks, are made up of one of each of the primary colors, red, green, and blue. When we combine those, we get white light. That represents a colorless baryon. Mesons are made up of quarks, one having a color and the other having its anticolor. So a red anti-red is colorless, a blue anti-blue is colorless, and so on. Gluons, which are the exchange particle of the strong force, have a combination color and anticolor. So a gluon could be red anti-green, or blue anti-red, something like that. In strong force interactions, color has to be conserved. Before we move on, let's clear something up. We don't think that quarks are actually red or green or blue. What is true is that there is some property that these quarks have that come in three, actually six when you think of the anticolors, varieties. We simply use the idea of colors and our understanding of how colors can add up or cancel out as a useful analogy. Here's our example of the Feynman diagram for a strong interaction. This Feynman diagram shows an interaction between an up quark and a down quark. These could be perhaps an up quark and a down quark within a proton or within a neutron. The gluon that's being transmitted between them is holding them together. As we've seen before, the arrows here are pointing forward in time, so we can interpret these as particles, not antiparticles. What I really want to focus on here are all the colors. So we have a green up quark entering the interaction and a blue down quark entering the interaction. The gluon carries some color from the up quark to the down quark, which results in both of them changing color. However, in this entire interaction, color has to be conserved. The gluon in this case is green and anti-blue. When the up quark transmits the gluon, the gluon carries away the green from the up quark and also carries away anti-blue. And if you think about it, taking away anti-blue leaves blue. The same gluon delivers green to the blue down quark and also delivers anti-blue to the original blue down quark. So the blue and the anti-blue kind of cancel out and the down quark is left as green. So you can see here that each quark changes color, but the flavor, the type of quark doesn't change. The up is still an up and the down is still a down. The strong force is responsible for holding the quarks together. It's not responsible for their transmutations or decays. It would be a weak interaction involved in the decay of a particle like a quark. For instance, when a nucleus undergoes beta decay. As part of beta decay, there's the emission of an electron and a neutrino. Since these are both leptons, they are unaffected by the strong force. Because the neutrino is neutral, it's unaffected by the electromagnetic force. Therefore, nuclear decay must be the result of some other interaction, which we now know is the weak interaction. In the process of a weak interaction, there's an exchange of particles known as the W and Z bosons. The W can be positive or negative, and the Z boson is neutral. This is the only type of interaction through which a quark can change flavor. Here's an example of beta decay, as represented by a Feynman diagram. A down quark enters the interaction and then emits a W minus boson. If a particle that starts off with a negative one third charge loses negative one charge, it becomes positive two thirds charge. This is the charge of an up quark, which we can see leaving the first part of this interaction. The W minus boson then decays into an electron and an antineutrino. In this second step of the interaction, we can see that charge is conserved because the W boson has a charge of negative one, 
and the electron coming out of the interaction has a charge of negative 1, and neutrinos are neutral. We can also see that lepton number is conserved in this second step of the interaction. Coming into the interaction, the W- boson has a lepton number of 0. Coming out of the interaction, we have an electron antineutrino with a lepton number of negative 1, and an electron with a lepton number of positive 1, which of course adds up to 0. Like I said before, this is just one example of a weak interaction and how we can represent it using a Feynman diagram. Soon, we'll get practice interpreting other Feynman diagrams and drawing Feynman diagrams of our own. That's it for now. See you next time.